Part two of The Machine Stops. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. The Machine Stops by E. M. Forster. Part two. The Mending Apparatus. By a vestibule, by a lift, by a tubular railway, by a platform, by a sliding door, by reversing all the steps of her departure, did Vashti arrive at her son's room, which exactly resembled her own. She might well declare that the visit was superfluous. The buttons, the knobs, the reading-desk with the book, the temperature, the atmosphere, the illumination, all were exactly the same. And if Kuno himself, flesh of her flesh, stood close beside her at last, what profit was there in that? She was too well bred to shake him by the hand. Averting her eyes, she spoke as follows. "'Here I am. I have had the most terrible journey, and greatly retarded the development of my soul. It is not worth it, Kuno, it is not worth it. My time is too precious. The sunlight almost touched me, and I have met with the rudest people. I can only stop a few minutes. Say what you want to say, and then I must return.' I have been threatened with homelessness," said Kuno. She looked at him now. I have been threatened with homelessness, and I could not tell you such a thing through the machine. Homelessness means death. The victim is exposed to the air, which kills him. I have been outside since I spoke to you last. The tremendous thing has happened, and they have discovered me. But why shouldn't you go outside? she exclaimed. It is perfectly legal, perfectly mechanical, to visit the surface of the earth. I have lately been to a lecture on the sea. There is no objection to that. One simply summons a respirator and gets an aggression permit. It is not the kind of thing that spiritually-minded people do, and I begged you not to do it. But there is no legal objection to it." I did not get an aggression permit. Then how did you get out? I found out a way of my own." The phrase conveyed no meaning to her, and he had to repeat it. "'A way of your own?' she whispered. "'But that would be wrong!' Why? The question shocked her beyond measure. "'You are beginning to worship the machine,' he said coldly. "'You think it irreligious of me to have found out a way of my own. It was just what the committee thought when they threatened me with homelessness." At this she grew angry. "'I worship nothing!' she cried. "'I am most advanced. I don't think you irreligious, for there is no such thing as religion left. All the fear and the superstition that existed once have been destroyed by the machine. I only meant that to find out a way of your own was—besides, there is no new way out. So it is always supposed except through the vomitories, for which one must have an aggression permit. It is impossible to get out. The book says so." Well, the book's wrong, for I have been out on my feet. For Kuno was possessed of a certain physical strength. By these days it was a demerit to be muscular. Each infant was examined at birth, and all who promised undue strength were destroyed. Humanitarians may protest, but it would have been no true kindness to let an athlete live. He would never have been happy in that state of life to which the machine had called him. He would have yearned for trees to climb, rivers to bathe in, meadows and hills against which he might measure his body. Man must be adapted to his surroundings, must he not? In the dawn of the world our weaklings must be exposed on Mount Tegetus. In its twilight our strong will suffer euthanasia, that the machine may progress that the machine may progress, that the machine may progress eternally. You know that we have lost the sense of space. We say space is annihilated, but we have annihilated not space, but the sense thereof. We have lost a part of ourselves. I determined to recover it, and I began by walking up and down the platform of the railway outside my room. Up and down until I was tired, and so did recapture the meaning of near and far. Near is a place to which I can get quickly on my feet, 
not a place to which the train or the airship will take me quickly. Far is a place to which I cannot get quickly on my feet. The vomitory is far, though I could be there in thirty-eight seconds by summoning the train. Man is the measure. That was my first lesson. Man's feet are the measure for distance, his hands are the measure for ownership, his body is the measure for all that is lovable and desirable and strong. Then I went further. It was then that I called to you for the first time, and you would not come. This city, as you know, is built deep beneath the surface of the earth, with only the vomitories protruding. Having paced the platform outside my own room, I took the lift to the next platform and paced that also, and so with each in turn, until I came to the topmost, above which begins the earth. All the platforms were exactly alike, and all that I gained by visiting them was to develop my sense of space and my muscles. I think I should have been content with this. It is not a little thing. But as I walked and brooded, it occurred to me that our cities had been built in the days when men still breathed the outer air, and that there had been ventilation shafts for the workmen. I could think of nothing but these ventilation shafts. Had they been destroyed by all the food tubes and medicine tubes and music tubes that the machine has evolved lately? Or did traces of them remain? One thing was certain. If I came upon them anywhere, it would be in the railway tunnels of the topmost story. Everywhere else all space was accounted for. I am telling my story quickly, but don't think that I was not a coward, or that your answers never depressed me. It is not the proper thing, it is not mechanical, it is not decent to walk along a railway tunnel. I did not fear that I might tread upon a live rail and be killed. I feared something far more intangible, doing what was not contemplated by the machine. Then I said to myself, Man is the measure, and I went, and after many visits I found an opening. The tunnels, of course, were lighted. Everything is light, artificial light. Darkness is the exception. So when I saw a black gap in the tiles, I knew that it was an exception, and rejoiced. I put in my arm, I could put in no more at first, and waved it round and round in ecstasy. I loosened another tile and put in my head, and shouted into the darkness, I am coming, I shall do it yet, and my voice reverberated down endless passages. I seemed to hear the spirits of those dead workmen who returned each evening to the starlight and to their wives, and all the generations who had lived in the open air called back to me, You will do it yet, you are coming. He paused, and absurd as he was, his last words moved her. For Kuno had lately asked to be a father, and his request had been refused by the committee. His was not a type that the machine desired to hand on. Then a train passed. It brushed by me, but I thrust my head and arms into the hole. I had done enough for one day, so I crawled back to the platform, went down in the lift, and summoned my bed. Ah, what dreams! And again I called you, and again you refused. She shook her head and said, Don't! Don't talk of these terrible things. You make me miserable. You are throwing civilization away. But I had got back the sense of space, and a man cannot rest then. I determined to get in at the hole and climb the shaft, and so I exercised my arms. Day after day I went through ridiculous movements until my flesh ached, and I could hang by my hands and hold the pillow of my bed outstretched for many minutes. Then I summoned a respirator and started. It was easy at first. The mortar had somehow rotted, and I soon pushed some more tiles in, and clambered after them into the darkness, and the spirits of the dead comforted me. I don't know what I mean by that. I just say what I felt. I felt for the first time that a protest had been lodged against corruption, and that even as the dead were comforting me, so I was comforting the unborn. I felt that humanity existed and that it existed without clothes. How can I possibly explain this? It was naked. Humanity seemed naked. And all these tubes and buttons and machineries neither came into the world with us, nor will they follow us out, 
nor do they matter supremely while we are here. Had I been strong, I would have torn off every garment I had, and gone out into the open air unswaddled. But this is not for me, nor perhaps for my generation. I climbed with my respirator and my hygienic clothes and my dietetic tabloids. Better thus than not at all. There was a ladder, made of some primeval metal. The light from the railway fell upon its lowest rungs, and I saw that it led straight upwards out of the rubble at the bottom of the shaft. Perhaps our ancestors ran up and down it a dozen times daily, in their building. As I climbed, the rough edges cut through my gloves so that my hands bled. The light helped me for a little, and then came darkness, and worse still silence which pierced my ears like a sword. The machine hums. Did you know that? Its hum penetrates our blood, and may even guide our thoughts. Who knows? I was getting beyond its power. Then I thought, this silence means that I am doing wrong. But I heard voices in the silence, and again they strengthened me. He laughed. I had need of them. The next moment I cracked my head against something. She sighed. I had reached one of those pneumatic stoppers that defend us from the outer air. You may have noticed them from the airship. Pitch dark, my feet on the rungs of an invisible ladder, my hands cut. I cannot explain how I lived through this part. But the voices still comforted me, and I felt for fastenings. The stopper, I suppose, was about eight feet across. I passed my hand over it as far as I could reach. It was perfectly smooth. I felt it almost to the centre. Not quite to the centre, for my arm was too short. Then the voice said, Jump! It is worth it. There may be a handle in the centre, and you may catch hold of it and so come to us your own way. And if there is no handle, so that you may fall and are dashed to pieces, it is still worth it. You will still come to us your own way. So I jumped. There was a handle, and— He paused. Tears gathered in his mother's eyes. She knew that he was fated. If he did not die today, he would die tomorrow. There was not room for such a person in the world. And with her pity, disgust mingled. She was ashamed at having borne such a son, she who had always been so respectable and so full of ideas. Was he really the little boy to whom she had taught the use of his stops and buttons, and to whom she had given his first lessons in the book? The very hair that disfigured his lip showed that he was reverting to some savage type. On atavism the machine can have no mercy. There was a handle, and I did catch it. I hung tranced over the darkness and heard the hum of these workings as the last whisper in a dying dream. All the things I had cared about, and all the people I had spoken to through tubes appeared infinitely little. Meanwhile the handle revolved. My weight had set something in motion, and I spun slowly, and then— I cannot describe it. I was lying with my face to the sunshine. Blood poured from my nose and ears, and I heard a tremendous roaring. The stopper, with me clinging to it, had simply been blown out of the earth, and the air that we make down here was escaping through the vent into the air above. It burst up like a fountain. I crawled back to it, for the upper air hurts, and as it were I took great sips from the edge. My respirator had flown goodness knows where, and my clothes were torn. I just lay with my lips close to the hole, and I sipped until the bleeding stopped. You can imagine nothing so curious. This hollow in the grass—I will speak of it in a minute—the sun shining into it, not brilliantly but through marbled clouds. The peace, the nonchalance, the sense of space, and brushing my cheek the roaring fountain of our artificial air. Soon I spied my respirator, bobbing up and down in the current high above my head, and higher still were many airships. But no one ever looks out of airships, and in any case they could not have picked me up. There I was, stranded. The sun shone a little way down the shaft, and revealed the topmost rung of the ladder but I was hopeless trying to reach it. I should have either been tossed up again by the escape, or else have fallen in and died. I could only lie on the grass, 
sipping and sipping, and from time to time glancing around me. I knew that I was in Wessex, for I had taken care to go to a lecture on the subject before starting. Wessex lies above the room in which we are talking now. It was once an important state. Its kings held all the southern coast, from the Andretswald to Cornwall, while the Wansdyke protected them on the north, running over the high ground. The lecturer was only concerned with the rise of Wessex, so I do not know how long it remained an in international power, nor would the knowledge have assisted me. To tell the truth I could do nothing but laugh during this part. There was I, with a pneumatic stopper by my side and a respirator bobbing over my head, imprisoned, all three of us, in a grass-grown hollow that was edged with fern. Then he grew grave again. Lucky for me that it was a hollow, for the air began to fall back into it, and to fill it as water fills a bowl. I could crawl about. Presently I stood. I breathed a mixture, in which the air that hurts predominated whenever I tried to climb the sides. This was not so bad. I had not lost my tabloids, and remained ridiculously cheerful. And as for the machine, I forgot about it altogether. My one aim now was to get to the top, where the ferns were, and to view whatever objects lay beyond. I rushed the slope. The new air was still too bitter for me, and I came rolling back, after a momentary vision of something grey. The sun grew very feeble, and I remember that he was in Scorpio. I had been to a lecture on that, too. If the sun is in Scorpio, and you are in Wessex, it means that you must be as quick as you can, or it will get too dark. This is the first bit of useful information I have ever got from a lecture, and I expect it will be the last. It made me try frantically to breathe the new air, and to advance as far as I dared out of my pond. The hollow filled so slowly. At times I thought that the fountain played with less vigour. My respirator seemed to dance near the earth. The roar was decreasing. He broke off. I don't think this is interesting you. The rest will interest you even less. There are no ideas in it, and I wish that I had not troubled you to come. We are too different, mother." She told him to continue. It was evening before I climbed the bank. The sun had very nearly slipped out of the sky by this time, and I could not get a good view. You who have just crossed the roof of the world will not want to hear an account of the little hills that I saw, low, colourless hills. But to me they were living and the turf that covered them was a skin, under which their muscles rippled, and I felt that those hills had called with incalculable force to men in the past, and that men had loved them. Now they sleep, perhaps for ever. They commune with humanity in dreams. Happy the man, happy the woman who awakes the hills of Wessex, for though they sleep they will never die." His voice rose passionately. "'Cannot you see?' Cannot all you lecturers see that it is we that are dying, and that down here the only thing that really lives is the machine? We created the machine to do our will, but we cannot make it do our will now. It has robbed us of the sense of space and of the sense of touch. It has blurred every human relation and narrowed down love to a carnal act. It has paralyzed our bodies and our wills, and now it compels us to worship it. The machine develops, but not on our lies. The machine proceeds, but not to our goal. We only exist as the blood corpuscles that course through its arteries, and if it could work without us it would let us die. Oh, I have no remedy, or at least only one, to tell men again and again that I have seen the hills of Wessex, as Aylford saw them when he overthrew the Danes. So the sun set. I forgot to mention that a belt of mist lay between my hills and other hills, and that it was the colour of pearl. He broke off for the second time. "'Go on,' said his mother wearily. He shook his head. "'Go on. Nothing that you say can distress me now. I am hardened.' I had meant to tell you the rest, but I cannot. I know that I cannot. Goodbye. Vashti stood irresolute. All her nerves were tingling with his blasphemies. But she was also inquisitive. "'This is unfair,' she complained. 
You have called me across the world to hear your story, and hear it I will. Tell me, as briefly as possible, for this is a disastrous waste of time, tell me how you returned to civilization. Oh, that, he said, starting. You would like to hear about civilization? Certainly. Had I got to where my respirator fell down? No, but I understand everything now. You put on your respirator and managed to walk along the surface of the earth to a vomitory, and there your conduct was reported to the Central Committee. By no means. He passed his hand over his forehead, as if dispelling some strong impression. Then, resuming his narrative, he warmed to it again. My respirator fell about sunset. I had mentioned that the fountain seemed feebler, had I not? Yes. About sunset it let the respirator fall. As I said, I had entirely forgotten about the machine, and I paid no great attention at the time, being occupied with other things. I had my pool of air into which I could dip when the outer keenness became intolerable, and which would possibly remain for days, provided that no wind sprang up to disperse it. Not until it was too late did I realize what the stoppage of the escape implied. You see, the gap in the tunnel had been mended, the mending apparatus. The mending apparatus was after me. One other warning I had, but I neglected it. The sky at night was clearer than it had been in the day, and the moon, which was about half the sky behind the sun, shone into the dell at moments quite brightly. I was in my usual place, on the boundary between the two atmospheres, when I thought I saw something dark move across the bottom of the dell and vanish into the shaft. In my folly I ran down. I bent over and listened, and I thought I heard a faint scraping noise in the depths. At this, but it was too late, I took alarm. I determined to put on my respirator and to walk right out of the dell. But my respirator had gone. I knew exactly where it had fallen, between the stopper and the aperture, and I could even feel the mark that it had made in the turf. It had gone, and I realized that something evil was at work and I had better escape to the other air, and if I must die, die running towards the cloud that had been the color of a pearl. I never started. Out of the shaft, oh, it is too horrible, a worm, a long white worm had crawled out of the shaft and was gliding over the moonlit grass. I screamed. I did everything that I should not have done. I stamped upon the creature instead of flying from it, and it at once curled round the ankle. Then we fought. The worm let me run all over the dell, but edged up my leg as I ran. Help! I cried. That part is too awful. It belongs to the part that you will never know. Help! I cried. Why cannot we suffer in silence? Help! I cried. When my feet were wound together, I fell, I was dragged away from the dear ferns and the living hills, and past the great metal stopper, I can tell you this part, and I thought it might save me again if I caught hold of the handle. It also was enwrapped, it also. Oh, the whole dell was full of the things. They were searching it in all directions, they were denuding it, and the white snouts of others peeped out of the hole, ready if needed. Everything that could be moved they brought, brushwood bundles of fern, everything, and down we all went intertwined into hell. The last things that I saw, ere the stopper closed after us, were certain stars, and I felt that a man of my sort lived in the sky. For I did fight, I fought till the very end, and it was only my head hitting against the ladder that quieted me. I woke up in this room. The worms had vanished. I was surrounded by artificial air, artificial light, artificial peace, and my friends were calling to me down speaking tombs to know whether I had come across any new ideas lately. Here his story ended. Discussion of it was impossible, and Vashti turned to go. "'It will end in homelessness,' she said quietly. "'I wish it would,' retorted Kuno. "'The machine has been most merciful.' I prefer the mercy of God. By that superstitious phrase, do you mean that you could live in the outer air? Yes. Have you ever seen round the vomitories the bones of those who were extruded after the great rebellion? Yes. 
they were left where they perished for our edification. A few crawled away, but they perished too. Who can doubt it? And so with the homeless of our own day. The surface of the earth supports life no longer. Indeed. Ferns and a little grass may survive, but all higher forms have perished. Has any airship detected them? No. Has any lecturer dealt with them? No. Then why this obstinacy? Because I have seen them, he exploded. Seen what? Because I have seen her in the twilight, because she came to my help when I called, because she too was entangled by the worms, and luckier than I was killed by one of them piercing her throat. He was mad. Vashti departed, nor in the troubles that followed did she ever see his face again. End of part two.